How many of you know someone who has autism? Raise your hand. How many of you know teachers or therapists that work with children with autism? And how many of you are familiar with the heartbreak and the difficulty that families encounter with children with autism? So almost all of you have raised your hands, and I'm sure those of you who are watching this will have similar experiences. Autism is on the rise. Just last month, the Centers for Disease Control put the estimates at 1 in 68 children and 1 in 42 boys being diagnosed with autism. Just to put that in perspective, that is or represents an almost 80% increase in autism in just 10 years. We have an epidemic on our hands. We need new solutions. And at Curemark, we recognize that new solutions and innovation and change comes about as a result of disruptive technology. And so I became involved with disruption at a very early age. It started for me in the sixth grade. That's me with a circle around my face. I was a winner of the sixth grade science fair project. And my project was called Coronary Artery Bypass, the Future of Cardiac Care. <laughs> and so I was fascinated with the heart back then because Christian Barnard had just done the first heart transplant the year before. And my grandmother, who had rheumatic fever as a child, had one of the first pig valve transplants. And so the heart fascinated me. And so I wanted to do this project. And I wanted to make what I called, or what we would call today, a virtual bypass. But back then, virtual meant that I had to go to the hobby store and get tubes, right? And I dyed the tubes blue with the help of my mom, representing the vein in the leg, and red, the, the artery that needed to be bypassed. And so we used these tubes to show that in this virtual bypass. And then I needed to figure out how to show the heart. So I took one of these old West Clock clocks. Most of you probably don't know them, but you would wind them, and they had a very large sound that they made when they would wake you up. So I took plastic wood, covered the West Clock clock with the plastic wood. And what does the heart and that clock have in common? They both tick, that's right. They both tick. So back then in my sixth grade mind, I thought, how interesting, how amazing that you can take a tube and go around another tube, almost like going around a traffic jam, and have something important for people. Prior to the bypass, people either died or they were permanently disabled with multiple heart attacks. And so I thought, wow, isn't this really cool that this will change things? And I knew then that this was important. And I didn't realize that it actually represented what is disruptive technology. It would be called that today if we found the bypass today. And why is that? Because it's novel, because it solves a problem, because it's enduring, and it improves people's lives simply and elegantly. So now let's fast forward to the 1990s. I'm in practice. I am seeing children and parents, and a troubling trend emerged. And that trend was children coming into my office who were five years old who didn't speak, who were nine years old and weren't potty trained, who were six years old and never played a game with another child. And even more troubling was what the parents said to me. The parents said, my child won't look at me. My child won't hug me. My child will never say, I love you, mom, or I love you, dad. These children were in their own worlds. And really, what we were seeing was the beginning of autism. And so I thought, OK, I'm seeing these children. 
Nothing seems to be working that other doctors are doing. I need to find something. See if I can find a pattern. Something about them that maybe would give us a clue or give me a clue about what was going on for them. So I looked for patterns, as I do often, and found none. In fact, the hallmark was that there weren't patterns. So for example, a core symptom of autism is speech deficit. So I looked at speech, and some children don't speak at all. And some children speak a little bit or intermittently. Some recite whole passages to, to books and videos. And so I was amazed at the lack of pattern. But what emerged even further was what the parents would say to me. Beyond their heartbreaking vision or the heartbreaking understanding of the child not speaking or talking or looking at them, they also talked about what they ate, which I found to be really curious because the parents described it as a white food diet, a tan food diet, soft food diet. But the reality was, when I really looked at it, it was a diet that was high in carbohydrate and very low in protein. And so that intrigued me. It became a curious thing. So I thought, well, you know what? Maybe there's a physiological basis here. Everyone's thinking about behavior. But maybe there's something physiological. So I started doing blood and urine and stool tests on these kids and found something really interesting, that the first nine children I did all had low levels of an enzyme called chymotrypsin, which digests protein. So then I did more testing. And even as I did more testing, I looked at this. So here you have the first group of kids that I did with autism, without autism. The red dots represent children without autism, and the blue dots with autism. 10 is the dividing line. So a, 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 a value of 10 in chymotrips and above is normal, and below is abnormal. And so here, a pattern emerged. Children with autism had these low levels of this enzyme. So I started testing more children. And then I'm having dinner one night at my brother's home. The whole family's there. And as usual, he says, so Joan, what's up? Now let me give you a little background on my brother. My brother's like a rocket scientist. He actually developed the sun sensors that go on satellites that guide our cell phones and GPSs. That's what he did when he was in his 20s. And he says to me, so what's going on? And I said, well, I did all this testing on these kids. You know, there's this autism thing that seems to be emerging. And no one knows what causes it. No one knows what to do about it. But I tested these kids. And it looks like they're lacking an enzyme. And he says, wow. That seems like it could be really important. And I said, yeah, it could be, but I don't really know. He said, you know what, Joan? You should really patent that. I said, what? Patent what? Patent that? He said, yes, because if it's going to have a value for the children, it needs a commercial value. And you know what? I'll have my patent attorney call you in the morning. And Jay did that. He had his patent attorney call me in the morning. And he. Um, and then we started writing patents. So the first patent went in in 1999, later that year. And it was granted in 2003. And now we have dozens of patents in CureMark. But patent, having a patent alone was not enough. I kept thinking, what, what about this? What if this could really be important? What if there's a, a, a piece of this that could be really beneficial to the children? What, what should I do? You know, this is a gut brain thing. Wow, gut brain thing? And that, for me, was even a big paradigm shift. And I think out of the box to begin with. But others, and I thought, wow, this is disruptive, disruptive. But others thought it was crazy and foolish and silly. But that's when I'll be forever grateful to my dear friends, Susan and Eric. Susan and Eric will tell you that Curemark began at their kitchen table. And so one day, we're sitting there at the island in their kitchen, Susan and Eric and myself. And we're talking about this, just like I'm talking to you. And they've known me for 20 years at this po point. And they also know that I'll dog whatever problem it is to death, whether that's a child's problem or whatever it is. 
and we're talking, and in the middle of this conversation, Eric gets up, he goes to the desk that they have in the kitchen, he pulls out a checkbook, and he writes me a check for $200,000, and says, Dr. Joan, just go and do it. He said, because if you don't do it, you will never know if it's gonna work for these kids or not. Quit practice and just go for it. And I did. I quit practice, 25 years of practice, and I did that. I went out there to see if this enzyme could be beneficial. So I had to tackle autism. Now autism is a big spectrum disorder, right? So it's a spectrum disorder, that means there's a big constellation of symptoms, and therefore it needed a constellation of ideas and understanding. So let me just give you a little background here. This is autism spectrum disorder. These are the core symptoms. Associated with those core symptoms are secondary symptoms, a whole bunch of them. And then you add in GI issues, and you add in seizure disorders, and you have a very simplistic but view of autism. Even today, there is nothing approved to address any of those symptoms, nothing. The only thing that's approved is something for irritability that results in this, and they're antipsychotics, and they don't address autism. So I knew then, and I know now, that what had to happen needed to be very disruptive, because nothing worked. Many, many things were tried, and nothing worked. And so when you think about disruption, you think about Silicon Valley. Disruptive is Silicon Valley's middle name, right? So any even fleeting idea that they have, people throw money at it, uh, they want to do IPOs, they want to do all these things. And why is that? Because it's quick to market, right? It's easy to do, perhaps, and your return on investment is great. In life sciences, where clinical trials and FDA and all the rest of those things come into play, you have to publish and all the rest of that, Mm, nobody's throwing money at that. It's not happening. Silicon Valley, everything is pushed forward, and in the life sciences, everything is pushed back. So it's a very hard place to be. So where's CureMark today? Well, CureMark has been fast-tracked by FDA, which means that we have a product that has a high likelihood of being approved, and meets a very large unmet medical need. Secondly, we've raised over $50 million in the absence of venture capital, and we performed the holy grail of clinical trials, a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of children with autism, and we met our clinical endpoints, and that's all good. And now we're in the process of submitting our new drug application, a pre-application under the Fast Track program. We've made great progress, great, great progress in terms of getting this forward. Thank you. And so what have I learned? I've learned a lot. One of the things I've learned is that you need curiosity. For disruption to occur, you need curiosity. You need to be looking at things and wondering why. Right? You need a belief, a belief in what you're doing and knowing that you can take your product and test it against anybody's or anything, and you have belief in that product and in the outcome. You need to believe in yourself, and you need to be fearless. And you have to have a tenacity, an incredible tenacity to see it through. Because without these three pieces, you cannot disrupt the status quo. And indeed, Truemark has disrupted the status quo in many areas, but three main ones. One is in drug discovery and development. We looked at patients and their needs. We developed a drug to meet those needs. We took it through rigorous clinical trials, and now we'll bring it, hopefully, back to the patients. 
It's patient-centered drug discovery. We've disrupted the biotech financing model. We have raised money in the absence of venture capital from individuals, not from individuals with children with autism, but individuals who understand our mission, who understood this, and understand why I was doing what I was doing. And we've disrupted a medical paradigm where digestion is digestion, and brain function is brain function, and never the twain shall meet. Even when the byproduct of protein digestion is the very building block, these amino acids of neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, all who have major, major action in the brain. So we've done much disruption. And we're not done yet. We continue to discover things, to look at unmet needs, and to change the paradigms wherever we are. And when we're all together as a team, I remind my team every time why we come to work every day. We come to work every day because patients need treatments and families need hope. And you know what? After all, it's all about the kids. Thank you.